Good evening, and welcome to the 2023 Arthur Cobbold Memorial Lecture. The lecture is brought to you by the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas Public Talks series. As a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania acknowledged traditional owners of Lutruwita, Tasmania, Wanina, and the Palawa people. The Palawa are the original and traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today in Nipaluna, Hobart. We acknowledge their history of storytelling, knowledge sharing, and caring for the land, and we pay our deepest respect to all Aboriginal leaders in this community and throughout Australia. We also extend our recognition, gratitude and respect to all First Nations people who are in our audience tonight. I must extend a very special welcome on behalf of the University of Tasmania to our honoured guests this evening. We are very privileged to be joined by so many of you who are eminent and valued members of our community. I'd now like to introduce Professor Denise Fassett, the Executive Dean of the College of Health and Medicine at the University of Tasmania, to introduce our speaker and provide the official welcome. So on behalf of the university, I would like to express um, my sincere welcome to everyone that's joined us in the medical sciences, but also we know that we have many people that have joined us online as well for the 2023 Arthur Cobbold Memorial Lecture. I think um, in times like this, when we are gathered here, it's a reminder of probably how wonderful it is that we can come together and for such a significant event. But before I say anything else, I need to, and I will, I'd like to just paint a little bit of a picture of Arthur Cobbold for you this evening. This annual event honours the memory of Professor Arthur Cobbold, who was a founding figure in the establishment of the medical school at the University of Tasmania. He was also very prominent in medical education more generally, as well as health policy and administration in Tasmania. I'm sure that there are graduates, I'm not too sure how many, but there will be graduates from our School of Medicine here today who need no introduction to Arthur Cobbold. However, for the benefit of those who did not have the privilege of meeting him as I did, he joined our university from England as Foundation Professor of Physiology in 1964, and he worked here until his retirement some 21 years later. He served as Dean of Medicine for 13 years, and during his tenure, Professor Cobbold very much shaped the school with a passion for students to problem solve, and interestingly, for multidisciplinary approaches. Um, and in his case, it was really the fusion of physiology with um, Cyril Barnett in anatomy that sort of set that multidisciplinary foundation for medicine um, in train. And he also wanted to introduce students to patients and the community early on in the curricula. He was very much an inspirational lecturer. Uh, he was highly competent as a researcher and he was also an excellent administrator. And, you know, these are three things that um, he excelled at, that he fused together in his prominent role. But importantly, he was much loved by his students and he had um, a way of, I guess, his legacy is still infused in our curricula and everything that we do. So he still influences um, our medical curricula very much. And Tim, I was um, reading a little bit more history on, you know, learning something. I've been to all of these and learning something every year, but really thinking about when the medical school first started, all of his work, 
and the work that has continued. And um, I think he'd be very proud. So as a tribute to his work and his life, the Cobbold Memorial Lecture was established in 2011 in collaboration with his wife, Elizabeth. Um, that was two years after Professor Cobbold's passing. As I stand here today, I'm reminded of how fortunate we are to have this space where we can connect and where we can hear from leaders in their field. As Arthur once did, we remain committed to equipping our students with the capability to transform health outcomes through professional education and research, leading people to live healthier, longer and better lives. The ideas generated in this university focus on the solutions for our place, but they resonate far past the waters of Bass Strait. We seek to instill in our graduates a sense of this unique place in which they learn and in which they study and where they graduate. But we also seek for them to be able to understand the opportunities and the challenges. We hope they continue to problem solve, to innovate, to imagine, to thrive, and to bring solutions for our island and beyond. It is in this tradition that tonight's Cobbold Memorial Lecture is presented. And this is 12 years after the inaugural event. So I welcome our esteemed graduate and tonight's speaker, Dr. Alison Turnock. She's welcomed here tonight to present to you the 2023 Cobalt Memorial Lecture. Welcome, Alison, and I'll hand over to you. I would just like to introduce Dr. Turnock to you. It gives me very great pleasure to do that. Uh, Alison's a very distinguished graduate of the University of Tasmania. Her current role is as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the Tasmanian Department of Health. And this comes after completing her training at the University of Tasmania, including part of that training at the Rural Clinical School in Burnie. As a junior doctor, Alison participated in the pre-vocational general practice training program with placements across Tasmania and was an academic GP registrar with the university. She is now a specialist with dual fellowships in both general practice and medical administration. Initially working in clinical general practice and in medical education, Alison moved to work in the public service to grow the Tasmanian Rural Generalist Training Program and later became the medical director of the general practice and primary care in the Department of Health. Alison was a member of the primary health reform steering group that developed Australia's primary health care 10 year plan. And she has made foundational and fundamental contributions to ensure that Tasmania has a long term plan for providing the right care in the right place at the right time, based on strengthened systems of primary care. To deliver the 2023 Arthur Cobbold Memorial Lecture, does an apple a day keep the doctor away? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alison Turnock. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to Denise. Um, I'll just find my notes here. And thank you, everyone, for coming to um, join me for this um, talk tonight. I really appreciate um, your time and your um, ability to um, come and engage in a conversation in regards to general practice and primary care and, and health of Tasmanians. Um, I'd like to echo um, the acknowledgement of country and the traditional owners on which we're all meeting today. Um, as a registrar, I had the pleasure of working at the Aboriginal Health Service for a short time, and I learned a lot about um, the traditional owners of the land's approach to health and um, approach to 
um, consideration of health as far as a community rather than an individual and decisions made over generations rather than um, for the person at the moment in the time. And I think that we've got a lot to learn from the traditional owners in regards to how um, we make decisions in regard to our, our policy, in regards to our health system as well. So um, I thank the community very much for everything that you've shared with me. So why am I talking to you tonight? Um, as Tim mentioned, I'm a um, Tasmanian graduate of the University of Tasmania. I I'm actually a Tasmanian. Um, these are my grandparents, Wanda and Ian. Um, they lived in Rokeby. And um, the reason that that's relevant to our talk tonight is that we know that in Tasmania, um, the life expectancy gap um, includes between different regions of Tasmania where we live. So the life expectancy, if you're from Rokeby in 2021, was about 71 years. And in places like Bridgewater, 67. And if you compare that with places like Newtown and like Sandy Bay, it's closer to 85 or 86, which is nearly a 20 year life expectancy gap in a place where there's less than 20 kilometers apart. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about as a GP um, and as someone who's gone into medical administration is ensuring that people get the health services and that they need where and when they need them. And so this isn't just academic for me, this is quite personal, um, being from one of the areas that has the shorter life expectancy. So for those of you that aren't from Tasmania, what are some of the things you need to know about where we live? So according to the modified Monash model, which is a way of classifying geographical areas into how rural and remote they are, we don't have any major cities. We are a completely rural and regional state. And 40% of our state is protected national park or reserve. So we only live in about 60% of the land that's left. We are, contrary to many people's disbelief, um, the most distributed population in Australia. So whereas many other states live with great distances between, they often have groups of people when you get to the end of that distance. We're a bit different. We like to live in very, very small groups of people smattered just far enough apart <laughs> that we don't know that each other's there. So we're very distributed. And we're also very beautiful. Um, and we have won awards like the most livable regional city and the top, more recently, top small town in Queenstown, which is on the West Coast. If we have a little bit of a look at some um, demographic profiles, this shows in the red straps the population of Tasmania and in the grey straps the more regional Tasmania. And what we can see is over time is that we've had a change in our population distribution. So if this was 2001 and I flick through and I encourage anyone that likes a little bit of graphical data to get onto the state growth website and have a play because you can set the settings and make yourself a little video. Um, you can see that over time, we've got a population that has increased in its age um, with a smaller population in the younger and working um, age groups, which is a great success. So in Tasmania, oh, and what we also see here is, and it's topical today because um, many of you have read um, in the news last night or heard it on the radio this morning um, that one of our general practices just outside of Hobart, um, Greenpoint Medical Centre, has announced its, its closure in December. And so what we can see here is a population demographic of the um, LGA in that area, which shows that in 2001, and Brighton is the LGA, which is the grey and, um, sorry, the red and grey is Australia, what we can see is that over the last 20 years, there's been a significant change in the population of Brighton LGA from um, a younger population into um, a, an older population um, in that particular area. And it'll become apparent why that's important during the talk. 
So if we have a chat about what are the healthcare needs of Tasmanians, we can see from the slides that we just looked at that we're living longer forever, longer forever, not forever, longer than ever. Um, and that's something to really celebrate. Um, a lot of people have, have um, done a lot of work to make that happen. Um, but sadly, many of us don't identify ourselves as feeling well. So while Tasmanians born in 2020 can expect to live to about 80 years if they're male and 84 years if they're female, um, according to the Primary Health Tasmania report, Health in Tasmania, 17.5% um, of Tasmanians self-assess their health as fair or poor. I'm going to have a little bit of talk about why that might be. So one of the reasons many people don't feel well in Tasmania is because we have a high level of self-reported chronic disease. In fact, one in two Tasmanians have a chronic condition and one in 10 Tasmanians have three or more chronic conditions. And what we know is that if you're over 65, you are more likely to have chronic disease. So this graph shows that a couple of the chronic diseases, so stroke, diabetes, asthma, heart disease, cancer, and arthritis. And in the blue, we've got the percentage of all adults affected by these conditions. And in the green, we've got the number of people over 65. So arthritis is the most obvious difference. So you can see a bit over 20% of adult, all adults, but closer to 55% of people over 65. On top of that, we know that one in five Tasmanians are now over 65 years old. So what does that mean for general practice? This graph is from the RACGP, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners Health of the Nation report last year. Um, and it shows the number of services each patient has per annum, depending on their age. So for most people under 50, that's close to sort of between six and eight appointments a year. For people over 55, there's a steeper increase to when you're over 85, you see a GP about 18 times a year. So what does that mean for a place like Brighton. If we have a look in the change of the A structure in Brighton over the last, well, over the five years between 2016 to 21, and we look at the number of appointments that people will often have depending on their age, we can do a little bit of quick math. And what that shows is that in a place like the Brighton LGA, over that five year period, there was an additional need for more than 20,000 additional general practice appointments for that community over that time. So in 2021, the GPs in Brighton would need to provide more than 20,000 additional appointments to serve that community's healthcare needs. If we extrapolate that out for Tasmania, that's had a 9.3% increase in population over that same time. For the state, that's an increase of about 445,000 GP appointments per year, in addition to what was happening already in 2016. So some of the issues with general practice and primary care is that there's an additional demand that the population is um, needing, um, and that's great um, that um, people are seeking health care. The issue that we've had is that we've been seeing this come for a long time, and a couple of people have already spoken to me about this prior to the talk. Um, and the issue with general practice is there's no obvious signals to show how big this um, demand is on the health system because what we see now in the media is ambulances ramping at the hospital. And in general practice, that doesn't happen. In general practice, we have ramping of patients on telephones at eight o'clock in the morning trying to get an appointment. And I suspect that's possibly an experience that most people in the room or online have had but it's not something that is visible to the public, um, visible in the media. So what we're gonna have a look at next is the percentage of people who have visited GPs for particular conditions. And this is again, a range of chronic conditions, um, usually, 
that range from high blood pressure, depression, high cholesterol, asthma, arthritis, and anxiety um, up the top there. In Tasmania, people see GPs on average nine times a year, um, and they see them, 75% of them are really seeing them for cardiovascular disease. So a range of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, congestive heart disease. Another 50% of them are seeing them for musculoskeletal conditions, osteoarthritis, low back pain, osteoporosis, and another 45% relating to mental health issues. So that gives you a pretty big snapshot of the majority of things that GPs are working with um, people in regards to their health at the moment. If we have a look at self-reported psychological distress, um, this is different to a lot of the other graphs that shows that in the age group most affected by this is actually the younger population. And the self-reported um, psychological distress in young people between 18 and 24 is rapidly increasing. Talking about a couple of other areas, health areas, um, disability we know increases with age um, and about 25% of Tasmanians are affected by disability of some type. So that can be defined as a degree of limitation um, if the person has difficulty and needs assistance from another person, an aid or equipment, and that could be around communication, mobility or self-care. And while that affects 25% of Tasmanians um, and the majority um, older people, it does still affect um, about 10, 10 to 15% of younger people as well. If we continue to build our little snapshot of what health looks like in the community, in 2022, almost 25,000 Tasmanians accessed aged care home support. So they're supports that are delivered into the home while you're in the community and another 6,000 Tasmanians access permanent residential aged care. But the wait time for people needing placement in aged care was over 150 days, which is quite a long wait when you're um, looking to move into your new home. Palliative care is another area worth mentioning, um, which is just, about, just as much about living your best life as it is about dying with dignity. And about 70% of palliative care is delivered in the community, not in the hospital, by a number of different providers. And over 60% of people tell us that they would prefer to die at home. And currently only about 14% manage to. So the picture I've tried to create here is that we need a system that can respond to our healthcare needs as we age and experience more chronic disease. And at the moment, our system is designed for acute episodic care and is designed for single system problems with definitive solutions. So talking about single system problems and definitive solutions, we're even struggling a little bit in that space because when you don't address your preventive and chronic health needs, what happens? You often need urgent care. And urgent care is important. However, the answers to the urgent care issues we have are also eluding us resulting in that ambulance ramping and the bedlock that we're seeing. And last month, we've seen a transfer of care parliamentary inquiry announced to look at the timely transfer of patients from ambulances to emergency wards. So if we put that into the picture with what we know about chronic disease, we're living longer than ever, which is great and should be celebrated, but we're not feeling very healthy and not able to get the healthcare access that we need when we need it at times. So the problem statement has changed from how do we manage acute episodic care and infectious disease in younger population to how do we manage chronic care and continuity in a population with an older distribution. The irony of the urgent care being that if you focused on the prevention and the primary um, health, you wouldn't need so much urgent care. So we've had a little bit of a chat. I'm going to ask the people in the room, and sorry, the people online, I, I, I can't see your answers. Um, what do you think is keeping people away from the doctor? Is it apples? What sort of things do you think it could be? Cost? Access?
So GPs are concerned about the same things as the people in the room. The biggest concern 20% of GPs have is access to healthcare. They're worried about their workload. The patient financial issues, not the GP financial issues, the patient financial issues. Um, the Medicare and the GP remuneration does come next. Um, health system fragmentation, the aging population are the highest things. So if we have a think about what we know about the older population and the extra appointments that are needed, one of the other things to think about is who's going to deliver the services. So this is the work of Ruth and her team in the Health Workforce Planning Unit. Um, and this shows us um, how many GPs we have in Tasmania in 2019. So we had 607. Um, and that was a total of 545 FTE with an 8% change. And if you work out how many patient episodes of care you need in addition over a five year period for the Tasmanian community, and that we had, I worked it out to be 43 new FTE of general practitioners over a five year period as well. We're not keeping up with the demand. So what are we gonna to do to meet all of these needs? The international evidence is very clear that access to primary healthcare is associated with cost effectiveness equitable health outcomes and improved health outcomes, particularly for disadvantaged populations. So this is a picture from the Australia's primary care 10 year plan. And it recognises there needs to be a change in the primary care health system. From an illness system to a wellbeing system that focuses on patients having a role in their care, not looking at what is wrong with patients, because often it, it's not a problem that you've created, but what matters to patients? Is it that you want to be able to run around in the backyard and play soccer with your grandkids? Is it important to you that you can tie up your shoes? What is it that's important to you? Probably not a number on your HbA1c in most cases. That is important, but it's not what people care about in their functional day-to-day -day lives. We want to go from a focus on treatment to a focus on promotion and prevention. We want to go from having competing providers to a system where providers can support each other in their role for the benefit of the patient. So currently a lot of our system is set up in funding arrangements where you're often competing for grants or competing for um, resources. And if we can turn that around so that I mean, there's plenty of work, we've seen that, there's plenty of work for everybody to do, um, that we can work together. And to be honest, it's one of the things that the GP registrars really struggle with when they get to general practice, is we're taught to work in multidisciplinary teams through our medical schooling and in our hospital setting. And that's made extremely hard when you get to general practice because of the way that the funding is structured and the way that general practice systems as a private business um, are set up to work go from a volume-based system about how many can we do to a value-based system. Like if I do this for a patient, how is that going to benefit their, their um, health outcomes in their lives um, and to a coordinated and interconnected system. One of the themes of the, um, the series of talks is around sustainable development goals. And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for people at all ages. And Australia is party to seven core international human rights treaties with one of the rights um, being a right to health, which is contained in the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which includes Article 12D, um, which says it'll be creation of conditions which would assure all the medical services, medical attention in the event of sickness. So what the World Health Organization has done is also um, looked at defining um, universal health care which is healthcare for all people to the full range of quality health services they need when and where they need them without financial hardship from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care across the life course. So if we have a think about that and we have a think about you and your kitchen and your kitchen bench and you've got three kids and my sister's going to smile because this is her daily life and you've got one child who can stand on the floor and reach the bench one child who needs to stand on a stool to reach the bench and one child that needs to be in a high chair to reach the bench. They can all reach the bench. They've got different levels of assistance to do that. That's called equity. Equality talks about all three kids standing on the floor and only one of them being able to reach the bench. 
So universal healthcare is about giving the people the help they need to be able to access the services that they need. And that will look different for everyone depending on what people are starting with. I think that sometimes universal healthcare um, is mistaken to be free healthcare for everybody. And that's not something that as a system um, is sustainable for the community either. So let's have a look at Australia's health landscape. So this diagram shows that a lot of the um, health services are delivered in the community, in the green section, people living their everyday lives. And then if we have a look at the white disc, say so inc incrementally show um, the different levels of the health landscape. The white disc at um, the bottom um, shows the determinants of health, which are things that affect health, but aren't controlled by the health system. So things like employment, education, and housing, really, really important. Um, the next green circle starts to talk about promotion and prevention, which um, is in the realm of um, public health, um, largely, and also primary care. So we're talking about things like childhood immunizations, COVID vaccines, eating healthy diets, making sure you wear your seatbelt in the car, not drinking too much alcohol. We step up to the next level of healthcare and we look at primary care. So this is going to your physio, going to your GP, going to your pharmacist. And then we step up to the purple one, which is the smallest circle. And that's where we go to um, the hospital, um, use x-ray pathology and those sorts of services. So you'll see in the top, it's the right-hand corner, um, it talks about health system funding. And at the moment, the health system funding is such that we spend the most money on the smallest circle in the health landscape. GP care represents a pretty small proportion of overall health funding. It's the little, the little dark blue one um, on the end. Um, and the dark blue means that it's largely funded by the federal government. And then at the other end of the graph, you can see the public hospitals do receive um, federal government funding, but they have a large amount of state and local government funding um, for them as well. It means that the governments have to work together in order to get a health system change because they both have skin in the game in different parts of the health services. And if we have a look to see what the um, government, particularly the Australian government has done over time in regards to making things equitable for people, um, we've got a long history of doing this. So we've got, um, you know, old age and disability pensions, we've got sick leave benefits, um, and we've got Medicare. And Medicare really only came in in 1984 as it exists at the moment. And I think it's worth spending a minute to talk about um, the medical benefits, the Medicare benefit schedule and how it works because it's changed a lot um, as far as how it operates functionally, which I think has meant people have lost the meaning a little bit. Um, and when I was a kid, I used to remember going to the doctor and mum would hand over cash to pay for going to the doctor. And then we would drive into town and we would sit at the office at Medicare um, and we would wait for the number to come up. And then we would go to the office and they would have a look at our receipts and someone would hand back the patient rebate. So Medicare is designed to provide a patient a rebate for their health services to offset the costs so that they can access it. But now, because it's all electronic, we go to the GP and all of that happens in the little machine um, and we either pay the gap, which is the bit between the government rebate and the cost of the service, um, or we get bulk billed, which means the practice receives the patient rebate as the full amount for that particular service. So what that means in practicality and how general practice as a business works is that when you go and see a GP and most of the income comes through um, the activity in the practice, um, the money that you pay, whether that be through bulk billing or with a gap payment, is split between the GP and the practice. And the practice uses that money to pay for the reception staff, the nursing staff, the lighting, the power, all of the consumables and everything else that goes into running a business. So if the service costs $40, I mean, if the service costs $80, then, um, and being bulk billed is, I think, $39.80 at the moment. Um, 
there's a price differential of about $40. So what that means is that $40 less is going to the doctor, but also to the practice. So less ability to pay for the practice nurse, reception staff, the building, the car park and the electricity and everything that goes with keeping the general practice open. So what we're seeing at the moment is that particularly in communities, whether it be because of volume of patients' ability to pay, the um, fact that the Medicare rebate schedule hasn't been able to keep up with the price of um, the cost of running a practice or with inflation over the last number of years, the gap that used to exist to make a, pr a practice sustainable is now diminishing in size and we're starting to see practices close because practices as a private business can no longer make it sustainable. Socioeconomic status is a key determinant for GP billing. So what we know is that if you, um, if you are from a lower socioeconomic area, you're likely to be bulk billed more and when you are charged, charged less than if you are in a more affluent um, area. Um, but we also know that if you can't afford to pay, your GP is likely to bulk bill you um, when you're in the practice, um, when they can. And in fact, 62% of GPs regularly bulk bill patients they know cannot afford to pay. And that's out of the RACGP Health of the Nation report as well. As GPs, we know that the cost of healthcare disproportionately impacts the health of those who need it most. And that poorer per People with poorer health or long-term health conditions are twice as likely to delay seeing the GP due to cost. Having said that, because we work in a private business, there's limitations in what you can do. Currently, 48% of GPs report that it's financially unsustainable to continue practicing. So if we need more services for our chronic diseases but can't afford to pay and the business model is private, what do we do? We start to see the market forces resulting in more practices in affluent suburbs and less practices in lower socioeconomic, socioeconomic suburbs. We get fewer small locally owned private general practices and we get more corporate organisations running primary health care. Until recently, Tasmania has been relatively stable and not seen multiple practice closures. However, in the last year or so, we've seen closures in Ouse, St Mary's and Bridgewater, as well as some closures where people have then reopened. Areas of thin markets due to small populations, remoteness and socioeconomic status are most affected. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a Tasmanian issue. This is an issue all over Australia. So what are we gonna do? We haven't had any big changes to how Medicare works in a very long time, but the federal government has currently um, looking at bringing in My Medicare and there will be need to be multiple changes to the health system to get to where we need to go. Um, but some of these um, incremental changes will be fundamental in shifting a system towards one that better meets the needs of chronic disease and continuity of care. So this will be a new voluntary patient registration model that aims to foster that continuity of care and will start to link some of the payments for Medicare to things like longer telephone consultations, um, as well as patient um, populations like people living in an aged care facility um, and people visiting the hospital frequently. What it also means that going to the GP might look a lot less going into a room and seeing a GP, and it might look a lot more like that multidisciplinary team-based care that we talk about. It might look a little bit like from time to time having a virtual care consultation, and it might look like more engagement with your allied health and nursing teams. So what are some of the things that we're currently doing in Tasmania that are in that space? So we have Telehealth Tasmania, which is um, run out of our hospital for our outpatient, um, outpatient services. So that means people in our rural areas can start to access outpatient clinics from the major hospitals without traveling into the hospital. And we've got hospital avoidance programs like COVID at Home Plus, which came out of the COVID pandemic, where people with respiratory illness were able to stay at home and get provided remote support um, by staff while they stayed in their homes. And I think there's a little video that might play. 
My name is Cassie Wedgwood and I'm a medical officer here at the COVID at Home Plus program. I'm proud to be part of this great team, which provides important, high quality, timely care to Tasmanians who are experiencing COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses. Our COVID at Home team is available 24 seven to support people through their COVID-19 infection, as well as eligible Tasmanians with other respiratory viruses, things like influenza and RSV, with a particular focus on those who are at the highest risk from those illnesses. Over 40,000 people have been supported through the program since it began in December 2021. Those who enrol at COVID at Home are given a remote monitoring kit, which enables us to record their observations and provide tailored health advice. Being able to provide this virtual care to people when you're unwell in the comfort of your own home is game changing. It's so important. So feel free if you have a respiratory illness to enrol, we can do it on the website. And in doing so, it means we can provide ongoing support and reassurance to people knowing you can contact us at any time at all hours if you need to. So that's one of the examples of how we're using uh, remote care. Um, but don't worry, it's not all going to be remote. That's not the solution either. There's always going to be a place for face-to-face. -face. And actually, if you talk to the GPs, they hated COVID and being online all the time. They really missed everyone being there face-to-face. -face. Um, Commas is Community Rapid Response Service. So this is a service that aims to keep, uh, that works in the intermediate care space between hospital and primary care. It aims to keep people out of the hospital. So if you go to see your GP and they know what management plan you need, but the general practice doesn't have the capacity to provide the additional services. For example, you might need IV antibiotics for a week, three times a day. Um, and that's just not feasible often with the way general practices are booked out at the moment. Um, they can contact the local commas nurses and the nurse practitioner led team can come out and visit the patient in their home and provide those services for a limited time for an acute exacerbation of a chronic illness or, a, um, or an injury. Um, so that prevents people from getting to hospital. If they get to hospital and they're seen in hospital, but the hospital team don't think they need to be there anymore, but they're not quite ready to go home without anything else, we also have hospital in the home where the hospital team can continue to look after you in the home um, if you need some ongoing management in the time um, after you've left hospital. And all of these things are trying to get the right care in the right place at the right time by the right person. But knowing what that is, is actually the people that know what that looks like for their communities and the people in the community. So there's a shift in how we're planning for health into the future towards place-based planning. And this is a photo of the Tasman Multipurpose Service, which is down at Newbina. Um, and this was one of the first locations where Primary Health Tasmania led a group, including health consumers, TAS, um, the Tasmanian Health Service, Department of Health and the local community um, through having a look and seeing what services they had and what resources we all had and how we could better fit those resources and distribute things to match the needs of the community. And that community now has an active group that's engaged with all of their local services, um, the local pharmacy, the local general practice, the local aged care facility, to have an ongoing dialogue and conversation about is the um, service distribution and match right for that particular community. And that's um, expanding across um, a few other communities and will become embedded as part of how we do things here. Another place that had a look at what needed to be done was New Norfolk District Hospital. Um, and the district hospital out at New Norfolk now um, has a range of patients who are discharged from the Royal Hobart Hospital who don't need a tertiary level of care, but who have some rehabilitation um, needs that could be serviced in the district hospital. So there's a nurse practitioner that works in that hospital and provides um, care and management of those patients linked back to the geriatric team at the Royal. Um, but there's also a win-win for the GPs at the local general practice, who the nurse practitioner can sort some of the things that they can sort out while they're in the clinic during the day, and vice versa if the nurse practitioner needs anything from a medical practitioner um, they can also call on the local service, which has made it really a lot more sustainable for both sides and increase the amount that can be done in that facility quite substantially. But how do we get all of these teams into those rural areas? There's actually a lot of evidence behind that as well. 
Um, and this is a framework written by Roger Strasser, who's an Australian GP who's now in, um, in um, Canada. Um, and it would apply to multidisciplinary teams, but because I'm a GP, I'm going to stick with what I know and talk about GPs tonight. And I'm going to talk about workforce and training pathways and a few things that we're doing. So we've already talked about this. We've talked about um, the number of GPs that we've got in the state. But what I didn't mention before is that 28% of Tasmanian GPs, and this is back in 2019, were over 60 years of age. So when I say Tasmanian has an ageing population, GPs also ageing population. We have an average age of 54 at the moment, well, in 2019. So what are we doing? So some of the things that are happening, and um, it starts here at the university, is that we're, um, we've got the, what, what we know is that if we train locally, people are more likely to stay locally. If we have people from rural areas, we're likely to have people that will work in rural areas. One of the things that I did when I was working at the university um, was I introduced, I looked after the medical student selection and I introduced the rural application process and the Aboriginal entry application process. And so with that, we see an increase in people being recruited in Tasmania from outside of Hobart, which is traditionally what's happened to having more people from um, the Northwest and the North. Um, what the university is now doing is they're piloted end-to-end -end training. And what that means is that um, people who are choosing to do medicine in the North and Northwest can do that entire training in those regions without having to move to Hobart. They can still move to Hobart if they want to, but for some people who have established families and other reasons to stay in those regions, moving to Hobart is just not possible. So we're losing people to medical school um, because of that reason. So we've currently got a grant application in for another 20 positions uh, for Commonwealth supported places in the North and Northwest. Um, and we're hoping that we'll um, get a positive outcome for that, but we'll, we'll wait and see. Now, this is a picture from a Tasmanian Rural Generalist Pathway team who are located up in Burnie. Um, and we obviously start with medical students. Actually, the Rural Clinical School, medical students go out and talk to people in schools all the time about doing health as a career. Um, but this is the pathway to get from a medical student through to a rural generalist. A rural generalist is a GP that also has ED skills and an additional skill in another area. So it could be palliative care, paediatrics, more emergency, mental health, and to become a rural generalist from a medical student takes about 10 years. So it's not quick to train a rural generalist or a GP. Um, generally, people do their intern year. And what we do is we give people scholarships as a student if they want to do this pathway. Um, and as part of that scholarship, they get their mandatory general practice training rotations in the hospital, which includes medicine, surgery, emergency, paediatrics, and sometimes anaesthetics and ONG. Um, and they all do a rural clinic, a rural 13 week placement in their intern year and then another one in their RMO year. So places like St. Helens, Scottsdale, Queenstown, King Island. Um, once they've done their hospital rotations, um, they go into general practice training. Um, and in general practice training, they train in the community and they do a 12 month um, additional skills training post. So for example, at the moment, um, there was a, um, what do we got? We've got um, Aaron, who's a rural generalist in Deloraine, who's done a 12 month additional skills post in statewide mental health service. Um, we've got people who have gone to Antarctica that have done expedition medicine. We've got, and you'll say expedition medicine, that doesn't sound like what Tasmania needs, but do you know what? All of those skills that those people need to learn to look after a community that is disconnected from the rest of Tasmania for five or six months makes them a very good um, general practitioner, public health physician, emergency practitioner. And if you've got one of them in your community, you're probably going to be pretty well served. Um, and they do work. They've worked in Queenstown and Dover and other rural places around Tasmania. The little sheep is to remind me to say, the pathway only works if you have all of the pieces that are connected together. Um, and a colleague of mine, Professor Paul Worley, who's in South Australia, he was the inaugural National Rural Health Commissioner, says we have to shave the whole sheep, shear the whole sheep. If we don't shear the whole sheep, the sheep get sick. So we need to shear the whole sheep and have all of the elements of the training pathway to create the workforce that we need. And if we miss any of these elements, we're not gonna achieve the workforce outcomes that we need. What I'm gonna do is let the Rural Generalist trainers talk for this second. To 
some degree, at least part of most people's motivation to do medicine is to help people, help, help society in some way. And one of the best ways to do that is to do what's needed. I grew up in Borneo and actually went to school in Malaysia. Unfortunately, in, I guess, Malaysia at that point in time, there's not much uh, medical professions that go into things like palliative care. So unfortunately, I had a few family members that sort of died not receiving the medical care that they needed. So I just thought, why not? Why not do medicine? I like to put myself in a position where I work in a pretty, pretty broad context. I think that it'll make for a pretty interesting life. And also, it's just what's needed. Since I've been working, you know, since you come to some of these small communities, you just really see how difficult it is for places like this to retain the medical teams that are around and to for patients to get the care that they need and things. So now I really see just how much of a need there is for people to be coming to small communities like this. So that's sort of making me more passionate about rural medicine. That's kind of one of my really niche passion interests in medicine is uh, wilderness and expedition medicine. And I think rural generalism really is the, the best background skills that you could have for that type of work. In, in managing medical situations with suboptimal resources available. When I first sort of came here, I think I was surprised by how, I guess, limited um, access was to sort of medical care. So if you wanted specialized things, you either had to go to Launceston or Hobart. And to me, I guess, that's a bit unfair. So then I sort of thought, well, if you had like a rural generalist that can sort of meet the needs of the people here, so then hopefully you can sort of stop people from having to sort of travel for medical care that they need. On a personal level, the, the wide variety of, of work you do um, at a pretty advanced level, uh, it, it's, it makes for a pretty interesting life. You're not going to get bored. Uh, you're, when you're the only doctor in a, in a large region, you're kind of forced and expected to uh, do a wide variety of things and I just love that like otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing it. I really hope that there's a lot more junior doctors that will probably go into the generalist pathway um, just because I think it's a really good learning experience and it gives you the skills so no matter where you go if you decide not to be a rural generalist it actually sort of gives you a really good um, base to probably go to wherever that you want to go. So these guys um are still training or have just finished their training. And um, Lisa, who was speaking there about um, coming to Tasmania from Borneo and, and um, doing her palliative care rotation, um, she's an, uh, one of a number of our registrars that have gone through a 12-month palliative care rotation in the Northwest and are building up the community palliative care services in that region under the leadership of Dr. Rosemary Ramsey, who will be talking about what she's been doing on the Northwest Coast over a number of years now at the World Family Medicine Conference in Sydney coming up in October. So the things that they're doing here are things that are of interest internationally. Um, Aaron, who I mentioned is in um, Deloraine. He's now working in the general practice there as well as the district hospital. He's a supervisor now of other rural generalist um, trainees um, and his um, registrar there at the moment um, is um, um, Suri is one of our um, international medical graduates who was a paediatrician before he came to Tasmania and decided to be a rural GP um, who has two children in medical school at University of Tasmania on the northwest coast as well. So he's definitely contributing to the pipeline. Um, and then um, Vince mentioned the wilderness and extreme um, medicine interest that he has and the Antarctic Division have been training rural generalists for over 50 years before they were known to be rural generalists. And, and Marcus is grinning because Marcus used to work with Graham and I on the Calm Council and looking at ways that we can leverage the research and development from the Antarctic Division in their telehealth and what they do for remote communities and how they work um, for the benefit of rural Tasmanians and Tasmania's health system. So... I guess this is my plug because why not? Um, if anyone's considering a career in health, there's ample opportunity and, and so much need. If you're looking for a career that is going to contribute to your community um, in any way, and it doesn't have to be medicine, it could be any number of um, health um, disciplines or even um, disciplines that aren't health or, or work such as, you know, um, our our orderlies or our cleaners or our food services people do. There's plenty of opportunity to contribute to the health workforce 
um, and we'd encourage anyone who's interested to, to reach out to the university or, or to reach out to someone that you know that works in health. They'll, they'll also encourage you, I'm sure. So I think in summary, we're living longer than ever and it's not apples keeping the doctor away. The health system is designed exactly to do exactly what it's doing at the moment, but it's no longer meeting our healthcare needs. We've got a shift towards um, a model that meets the, um, the, the needs of the community around chronic disease and at the right time in the right place, and it's going to look different. We can't keep doing the same thing that we've been doing because we're not getting the results that the community needs. And so it'll, it'll take a lot of people working together to, to get to that place. So what I'd encourage you to do and, and have a think about is how you're gonna get involved. And I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you now about um, the talk and, and any other questions that you've got in regards um, to health and primary health and the workforce and community needs. So thank you very much. Alison, thank you so much. Um, I'm incredibly struck by uh, what your talk has given us in terms of enhanced understanding of the healthcare environment that we all live in, we all use, and that uh, has profound implications for all of us and our families. The perspectives that you started with on the health, the very real health implications of different health statuses in different communities was, was particularly striking. Um, as was the connection that you drew between uh, prevention failures and acute care need and sorts of pressures that um, are uh, exerted upon our hospitals. So um, I'd like to thank you for those insights um, on behalf of us all. It was a, a profoundly insightful and interesting talk. Thank you very much. We now enter a question and answer phase. So, Alison, this is a, a question... Um, perhaps in the form of a comment for you to respond to. Uh, most GPs are available three days per week. Growing up in Lindisfarne in the 1950s and 1960s, the three GPs were available 24 seven. They came out at night and that was good because lots of people didn't have a car. So um, does that present an opportunity for comment on some of the changes perhaps from um, 30, 40 years ago that we're seeing the impact of now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the question. Um, I think you're right. There's a shift in how um, GPs work, but I don't think it's unique to GPs. I think it's it's something that we're seeing across lots of industries. Um, I think um, there are still a lot of GPs that do work very full time jobs, um, and there's more GPs as well that are, that are doing again what's across lots of industries portfolio careers. So they might do three days a week in general practice, but they might also be teaching at the university a day a week and working at family planning a day a week or maybe doing some shifts in the emergency or now at the urgent care centres. So um, there are definitely people working part-time, but there's also definitely a lot of people working um, the portfolio um, career and contributing to the health services across different areas as well. Thank you very much. Um, and perhaps we go to our first question in the audience now. Hello. Ah, great. Alison, um, we've talked about some of these things before, but I'm really interested in your perspective and caveat. I don't have any answers to these questions either. So um, it, it really goes to the, the heart of uh, equity, which you talked about early in your presentation. And when we look at some of these reforms coming in, like uh, My Medicare, um, uh, telehealth Tasmania, all of these rely on some degree of digital and health literacy to access. So I think um, when I was speaking to our Consumer Advisory Council earlier this week about some of these things, you know, um, I, I'm a digital advocate, but I acknowledge that there is a quite a large, I think, percentage of our population that is vulnerable and not able to easily access those services. So if I'm going to access the My Medicare reform, at the moment I have to log into my MyGov account and nominate a GP. From an equity perspective, how do you think we can really bolster the support to that percentage of the population that can't do that easily and make sure they have the same opportunity? Yeah, thanks, Russell. It's a really good question. And I think um, one that we need to keep revisiting so that we don't find ourselves ex unintentionally excluding people from healthcare options. 
Um, Tasmania does have um, some significant issues around um, connectivity. Um, so the ability for people to have internet or computer access, it's not always um, a given here. Um, we also have a fairly low literacy rate, which means filling out some of these forms um, and navigating some of these um, processes quite difficult. Um, even with a high literacy, sometimes the processes are quite difficult to navigate and there's a lot of nods in the room. Um, so I think um, we need to keep being mindful of that. Um, and where possible, we need to um, really draw on the strengths that community has around looking after each other. And if you've got people in your family or your friendship group or your neighbour that can't access some of these things, what role you might have um, in supporting them to do that. Um, but also as health providers, um, being mindful that we don't ask people to undertake tasks that they're not well equipped to do and what supports we might have in our services to um, spend time to link somebody with a telehealth appointment if that means somebody from within the practice does that telehealth appointment with them at the sort of receiving end of the telehealth appointment um, as well. So I think there are things that we need to do to help enable that um, and be mindful that that um, that equity thing, everybody needs a different level of support um, to access services. This is a question around chronic disease, dementia in particular. Um, I'm interested in the role of dementia. Um, now, the number one cause of death for women in Australia. Can you comment on the GP's role in this area? I think perhaps it's an opportunity to comment on general practitioner's role in managing chronic disease in general and, and some of the pressures that that exerts. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. And absolutely, dementia is um, increasing in prevalence and um, something that a lot of people are experiencing or, or will experience in the future. Um, and the University of Tasmania has um, done a lot of work in this area and has a whole bunch of um, resources and MOOCs, which are massive online open courses for people that haven't come across MOOCs before, in how to prevent dementia. So a lot of the factors that we talked about um, in regards to um, cardiovascular disease um, risk factors, so um, are, are similar for dementia. So making sure that you um, make those lifestyle choices will help your dementia risk as well. Um, but for general practice, I mean, certainly one of the um, benefits of being a general practitioner is that you get to know people over time. And so you also often um, get to see things change in people um, that you might not see if you didn't know them prior to seeing them in, in a one-off consultation. Um, and so general practice has a role um, in, in dementia all the way from, from screening um, and diagnosis through, through to management of um, sort of mild um, through to um, sort of quite advanced dementia. Um, and th that includes not just the patient, but often their family, their caregivers, um, and, and a whole bunch of um, other team members, um, often home support services, um, and then eventually sort of aged care providers often, um, depending on, on the situation. So a GP can really help navigate um, those systems. Um, and the Medicare benefit schedule does recognise um, not just dementia, but a, a whole array of um, chronic disease um, needs of the community through chronic disease management plans, um, which enable people to access um, additional um, assistance for allied health, for example. Um, it's not always um, enough, um, but it, it does assist to an extent. And I think that's where the My Medicare has potential. So if we if we look at My Medicare and if you are nominated to be linked to a general practice, that fundamental shift is then a building block for um, different ways of looking at how to support um, people, particularly with chronic diseases. So whether that be um, that um, that leads in the future to block funding. So you might get a block of funding that can be choose to use in a range of different ways rather than and, you know, a little bit of funding for each time you see a different person, which means you could be a little bit more creative with how you use that funding, um, if particularly if you're in a, in a, um, in a complex situation. 
Um, so they're the sorts of things that the My Medicare um, building block is supposed to be taking a step towards being able to do. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, it seems to me that at the crux of a lot of this problem is government funding um, and the Medicare rebate. Um, one of our children actually is a, a graduate of the medical school in Tasmania, now working as a GP on the mainland. And he's there with a cohort of other ex-medical school people. And as a GP, he is on the lowest pay scale compared to those working in hospitals, those who have gone into consultancies. And, um, and he said that the number of medical graduates going into GP training has plummeted from what it used to be. And it's now down to about 15% or something. Whereas once upon a time, I believe it was closer to 50%. So it seems that if we increase the Medicare rebate, we would attract more medical students into GP training and it would be more accessible to people in lower socioeconomic areas to access GPs because at the moment, as he says, to make a practice viable, he is being forced to bulk bill fewer and fewer patients. Um, and there's a whole thing with like the owner of the practice then expects their GPs to charge a certain amount, you know, to make a profit for the practice. So it's quite interesting talking to him about all the problems facing GPs and their patients at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I think it highlights um, two connected issues, um, the issue of funding for general practice and the issue of disparity in remuneration for um, uh, general practitioners uh, and primary care practitioners and specialists. So, Alison, would you be able to comment on those? Issues? Yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, and I think you're accurate in what you're describing. Um, and there, um, it's known to be a real barrier for doctors in training to choose to train as a specialist general practitioner. Um, what happens in general practice as a private business is most GPs are independent contractors. Um, so you leave the state service and you're no longer under the employment agreement um, and industrial um, you know, entitlements and things that come, come with that. Um, one of the things that um, Tasmania is doing at the moment is introducing a single employer model. Um, so the feedback to the National Royal Health Commissioner from the doctors in training in 2018 was that that was one of the reasons why they weren't going into general practice. Um, they would like to, but it, it was a barrier. Um, and so they've trialled it in Murrumbidgee, New South Wales, and in the Riverlands in South Australia, where the third on. And ours is a statewide program. We've got four registrars on it at the moment. And what it means is that it, um, they're able to stay employed by the state service while they're in the community doing their general practice training. Um, and it's a small program, but it's and it's a pilot. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but we're really hoping that that um, reduces the barriers for people entering primary care um, as, as one of the parts of the solutions, because there's going to be, be many parts of it. Um, we've also um, seen um, some of the general practice, particularly the corporate, starting to look at employment of general practitioners as well um, in recognition of, of that um, as an issue, particularly in other states where payroll tax is currently causing some concerns for practice viability um, as well. So I think it's another watch this space. I think we'll see a shift in how things work. Um, thank you very much for very provoking um, comments in your presentation. And um, my question is really around, I was struck in one of your slides with, you know, the, the amount of years that you and others have put into this specialist education to become general practitioners. And so I'm going to probably say something a little controversial here, but I find it really sad that, you know, members of my family, when they finally get to someone who's well-educated, a specialist in their field, that they don't get enough time for a start off. You're talking about all this chronicity and, and they get multiple referrals. And I'm wondering what your view is on really how one might tackle the issue that we know that when you've finally made it through the door to see your GP, there isn't enough time 
and then going to on waiting lists to see multiple people because you're older and there's chronicity isn't working either. Yeah, it's a real conundrum. Um, the the trade-off is seeing enough people for both practice sustainability, but also because you know whoever you don't see today will be waiting for a GP appointment for, you know, sometimes four to six weeks or, or so, depending where you are in Tasmania. Um, so about seeing enough people, but also spending enough time with people in the in the time to really sort through things and make a plan because um, oh, we could talk about that question, I reckon, for a good hour on its own. Um, often if you can make the time to spend with someone and sort through a few things, you can really, um, you can re really make a big difference over a couple of appointments. Um, the multiple referral thing becomes um, challenging when you don't have somebody that's overseeing how all of those things fit together. So as a GP um, and, and patients don't have one disease anymore, they have multiple diseases, but our guidelines are still written for people with one disease. So as a GP, you're often looking um, at a management plan with a patient and you're saying, well, this guideline says that we should do this thing, but this guideline says that we should do this thing. In your case, what do you think? We think this is the best, best option forward. And sometimes when people go off to multiple different um, specialties, they can get the response that they need for that particular part of their health without the full picture of um, the, the complexity and the multiplicity of, of diseases um, when they come back. So... I, I think it is a real issue and a real problem that doesn't have an easy solution. Um, but I would hazard a guess I'm pretty safe to say that most GPs would love to be able to spend the time with their patients to really sort that through um, and do as much um, of that chronic disease management in the community as possible. My experience as a clinical GP was there's also a very big difference into how much a patient will let you do um, in different settings. So if you work in a slightly more rural setting, there is a far bigger reluctance to get referred into the city and you'll be able to do more with the patient in the local setting um, and closer into the city, um, there's further expectation that you'll get sent to a, to a non-GP specialist to care for a similar, similar issue. So I think there's multiple different drivers for why people get um, referred to different areas. Um, and like I said, well, I reckon we could talk to that for a good hour if we wanted to. Longer. Uh, no doubt we could talk to, to that question and to, to others um, for at least that time. I'd like to thank um, all of you in our, our audience here and also our online audience for your questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for further questions, um, but I hope that the discussions that all of those questions have started will continue informally between all of you uh, and that new conversations about this area that affects us all um, will be started as a result of Alison's talk um, in diverse settings with colleagues, family and friends around the dinner table um, in work tea rooms, wherever you are. Um, uh, it's now my great pleasure to invite Dr. Rob Walters um, to provide a vote of thanks to Alison and to give us some reflections on this lecture series. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Tim. Um, look, as a GP, I was delighted when I heard the, uh, the subject for tonight. I'm one of those GPs that's in that 28% over the age of 60, a little, fairly, fairly considerably over that age of 60. Um, 40 years in general practice, and uh, ma'am, you were right that um, in my class, 65% of, of, the, of the medical students in, had the intention of becoming a GP. It's now down around between 14 and 15 per cent. Clear problem. Arthur Cobold was a unique individual, and I just want to do a quick link to Arthur because I was one of those people. I was one of the lucky ones. We all have um, people in our lives that influence our lives a bit, and Arthur was, in fact, one of those people. I, I don't think I would have probably done medicine without Arthur, who was fairly flexible, shall we say, with my... Um, Getting, getting through medicine. Um, Arthur, Arthur was um, 
as, as you heard from Denise, um, not only the backbone of, of the medical school, the early medical school here, but he was a, he was a unique individual in his early days in, in, in England. Um, if you haven't heard about Arthur, just go on Google and and um, put Professor Arthur Cobbold, and you'll you'll hear the most fascinating interview for about an hour, an hour and a half of Arthur himself, just by simply clicking on your on your screens, and you'll hear the full story. But he was a he was in the defence force in the UK. Um, he uh, was a teacher in a high school. He was heavily involved in politics. In fact, at one stage, it was alleged he was to succeed at Sir Edward Heath in the Conservative Party, and I think he was the treasurer of the Conservative Party. He gave all that up to come to Tasmania from St Thomas's, where he worked medically, um, to come and start the, the Department of Physiology and, um, and latterly as Dean of Medicine. He was a bit like the KGB too. He had informants. Um, and the, the highlight of, of, of uh, the year for medical students was, was Arthur's um, after-dinner speech at the medical students' dinner. I don't know whether they still have medical students' dinner every year, but, but Arthur used to, used to um, do these speeches where he'd um, very accurately um, describe some of the misdemeanours that had occurred within the various years and you'd see a lot of medical students shifting very uncomfortably in their chairs as Arthur described what he knew had happened. However, if anything happened that was very out of order, you would be summoned to Arthur's um, office and he would deliver the, deliver the message. And if needs be, take very serious action if it was a serious misdemeanor. But he was a fairly pragmatic fellow. And... Um, he would have loved tonight, Alison. I don't think you probably ever had the pleasure of meeting Arthur, but he was a guy who recognised the importance of a medical school within a community. And he was very proud of the fact that we produced a good product here. And I've experienced that myself in the UK when I worked over there as a locum. They'd ask, where, where was your medical school? And I'd say, Hobart. And they'd say, oh, fantastic. I'd say, why? And they'd say, because you produce a good product. And Arthur was very proud of that. Um, he would be delighted to know that, a, that someone who was a product of our medical school was creating um, a discussion that you have created tonight and that the work was being done the way it is. Um, as doctors, we work on evidence base and you've outlined that tonight. There's the evidence. That's what we're working with. 45%, I think it is, functional illiteracy, illiteracy in this state just makes it doubly hard. We've got to take the blinkers off, and you've said that, you've said that tonight. We've got to look at different models. I'm glad tonight was online because I'm hoping that somewhere out there there's some of our decision makers listening to what um, has been said. If they aren't, then I'll make sure they see it. So thank you very much, Alison. It was a wonderful talk and Arthur would have loved it. And now to uh, thank once again, uh, Alison for providing us with that extraordinary talk tonight. I'd like also at this point to extend my gratitude on behalf of the university and the Tasmanian School of Medicine to the Arthur Cobbold Memorial Committee members for their work on this series over fully the last decade as well as to our exceptional team uh, of event and front of staff house. Uh, without the dedication of that whole team, this event simply wouldn't happen. These Island of Ideas events are all brought to you as a Tasmanian and national and global public by our Island of Ideas public lecture series, which began in 2020 while it was not possible to have the sort of gathering in person that we're having tonight due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The program continues through 2023 in the hope that we can connect Tasmania's community and research to people across our regions into a global network of ideas about emerging issues. Conversations like this one are a fundamental and important part of the university's role. 
and collegiality and community and the way that collegiality and community are embodied in talks like this and evenings like this are values that date right back to the founding of this university. So finally, I'd like to thank everyone that has joined us in our audience. Um, and if I may, I'd like to particularly extend um, uh, a thanks to Peter and Mary Turnock for, for joining us. I'm sure you're incredibly proud um, of, uh, of our alumnus who we're also proud of, Alison. Together, all of you work in health-related fields and non-health-related fields. And we've got an opportunity each to make small changes, to have small but informed conversations after events like this, and to make a difference to our community on the basis of what we've learned. So thank you all again for taking part in this special event. And behalf, on behalf of the University of Tasmania, I'd like to wish you a happy and safe evening.